is going to cover uh, the most updated news on these this tornado devastation in western Kentucky and the response uh, to it, uh, our fight against COVID. And then we're going to end with good news because we have more new jobs in a year where we shattered our record for new jobs. So uh, even in difficult times, it's good to see that there is a uh, bright tomorrow. Uh, we can push through all the adversity that's been thrown at us, whether it's pandemic, devastating tornadoes, record ice storm, record flooding, and that's just this year, then there is a brighter future waiting for us on the other side than we have ever seen. So first, um, updating fatalities um, on the tornado. Uh, we can now uh, confirm, and, and I believe with accuracy, that the most accurate number is 76 Kentucky lives lost. And here is how we get to the 76. Remember, as of the last update, uh, the Department for Public Health had 75, but we were trying to track three people from Dawson Springs that had been at one point included in Hopkins County. Those three, we believe, are in the Caldwell County numbers. And Dawson Springs goes just barely into Caldwell and three um, of the deceased from um, that town are Caldwell County residents. So that would have pushed us back to 75, but we've lost one additional employee of the candle factory that made it out, but has since succumbed to their injuries. Uh, that person I believe lives in Callaway, but is included as a Graves death, which brings that to 22. And it reminds us that this might not be the last update we have to it because we have a lot of people hurting. Uh, you know, we, I was in, um, we'll talk about it in a minute. I was at Penny Ryle uh, yesterday, uh, giving out uh, shoes to people that didn't have them. Um, saw a kid that had been through the worst, throw on a new pair of shoes and run around and jump up and down. It was um, one of the best moments since last Saturday uh, or that Saturday that we have certainly had. But I also talked to a woman was picking up her kids um, that had lost her mom and her dad's in, in pretty tough condition at, at Vanderbilt. So please keep praying. Uh, 76 is devastating. It's far too many Kentuckians to lose, but there are still people that are fighting to hold on that are out there and they need our prayers, our love, our support, and so do their family members. Uh, zero uh, people missing and now no active search or rescue operations. So those are two pieces of good news. All state roads now passable. I think there's four county roads that are still closed. Uh, cell service, 98.8% operational. So I want to thank AT&T and Verizon for helping Graves, Fulton, Marshall, Caldwell, Muhlenberg, and, and LaRue. They had to get up. Power, the numbers are very difficult to calculate. We believe 31% of Graves County is still out. Um, 1,677 Mayfield customers without uh, power. We're now housing uh, 904 people, so 900 plus people in 20 plus uh, facilities that range from our state parks, which we'll mention in a minute, to hotels. In Warren and Hopkins County, we no longer have anybody in a congregate shelter. What that means is we got them in individual rooms and uh, during a pandemic, that's really important. We knew one of the most important things we could do to protect people from COVID after they've already lost their home is to get them in a place where they have more space and they have a private room and where we can uh, truly help uh, with regular meals and uh, counseling, which we hope at least most people are taking advantage of and, and having them at a place we know that we can bring the services uh, to them. We still have over 500 National Guard on the ground that will be slowly drawn down in some areas uh, in the coming week or so. Our Division of Forestry uh, has finished, but Fish and Wildlife has offered uh, man and woman power uh, to help out. Transportation still with uh, hundreds of individuals on the ground, everything from debris removal to continuing to work on the roads. As of today, 10,235 insurance claims have been filed. 
7,700 FEMA claims. Uh, and, and the pace is picking up over 1,200 FEMA claims yesterday. Uh, I did get a chance to talk to just dozens of families that had, I mean, they'd been devastated. Uh, they were still there, some of them without all of their family, which unfortunately had not made it. Uh, but I was asking each of them had they applied and started the process for FEMA, and a whole lot of them had. But it's important that we go through it every single time the ways that you can get in the system for FEMA. So can we put up that slide? Okay, the first is online, disasterassistance.gov. You can go to that through Safari or anything else on your phone. You can go to it using your computer or your tablet. You can call 800-621-3362 or you can um, go to the FEMA app. So those are three ways. The fourth way is they're canvassing neighborhoods that have been impacted. These are people in FEMA shirts with an iPad. They can help start your claim at that point. And they're actually now making uh, appointments with individuals that have been impacted. I talked to a lot of people and they said, my appointment is later today. They are moving really fast. There's already over a million dollars they've been able to get out to people in need through their claims. They also have mobile registration centers in Hopkins County. That's at the Dawson Springs library in Fulton County. It's at Gibson electric membership corporation in Hart County. It's at floral hall at the Hart County fairgrounds in Marshall County. It's at the Joe Creason community center in Caldwell County. It's at the Butler gymnasium, Muhlenberg County, Neal's chapel, general Baptist church, Graves County, the old Walmart location, Mayfield Plaza. So um, again, that's five different ways that you can make your FEMA claim. Please do it. Uh, from what I can tell, where we need where we need uh, to provide people help, um, are probably those that were struggling the most before this occurred, and walking them through the process and helping. Um, and then um, there are some that uh, that were believe that they were fully insured, wondering if they need to go through the process, you should. There are some things your insurance is not going to cover uh, that FEMA uh, is likely to. One of our biggest steps moving forward is debris removal. We'll have more updates on that next week. Uh, that involves uh, a number of different issues, but we are working through those with city and county leaders. We've made a lot of progress on that today, um, but there are still some different pieces to be worked out, but that is front and center, knowing how important it is as we move forward. I will say the Army Corps of Engineers is on the ground, and what they have said is that this is their most important mission uh, that they are working out on at the moment, and I believe that comes from the very top of the federal government. We continue to get incredible attention and assistance from every single type of federal partner. Uh, FEMA moving faster than we've ever seen, payments getting out faster than we've ever seen. All we have to do, because the federal government really wants to help, is connect those individuals who haven't talked to FEMA yet and make sure we get them with them. And I believe they will get the best service that anybody could ask for in, in trying to, to get them help. Let's have good news. Toy drive and Christmas events. This past week, we've seen an extraordinary response from Kentuckians and people across the country after Brittany, uh, the first lady, announced a toy drive for children in Western Kentucky. And as she reminded me, these kids didn't just lose their Christmas toys, they lost all their toys. And that's why she launched the Western Kentucky Toy Drive, which is now closed to donations after receiving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of toys. We actually have truckloads of gifts that are moving today. It's amazing because these kiddos, they've seen so much. They've seen things that we can't imagine, and it's heartbreaking. But thanks to the generosity of not just this state, but the entire country, they will now have a Christmas, a real Christmas, full of so many gifts, and, and I know where they can be uh, with their families. So, to help distribute these toys, 
We are hosting the Western Kentucky Christmas Storefronts tomorrow, Tuesday, December 21st. And we have a second day, Thursday, December 23rd. It's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Time. Locations are at Ken Lake State Resort Park, Lake Barclay State Resort Park, Penny Ryle Forest State Resort Park, Hope House Ministries at the Forest Park Baptist Church in Bowling Green, and the West Kentucky Educational Cooperative in Eddyville. These are the storefronts that the families are going to be able to come in and pick out those gifts that are most appropriate um, for their kids that they know, and to be able to take them home and give those kids a great Christmas. For those impacted who cannot make it to a storefront site, and if you've been impacted, go to the storefront site. Go. We're waiting for you. There's a whole lot there. We want to wrap our arms around you and make sure that this joyous time of year, we can do the very best for you that we can. But if you can't make it to a storefront site, please email toydrive at ky.gov with your county in the subject line to arrange another visit from Santa for your kids. It took a lot of folks to make these storefronts possible. A lot of folks. A lot of folks from my office are down there right now with a ton of volunteers. It's like we're working a mini UPS. And it is uh, pretty incredible to see the amount of boxes and it just keeps pouring in. But I specifically want to thank the Kentucky State Police, local law enforcement, our Kentucky State Park employees, teachers, local volunteers, and so many more. You are making a difference for these Western Kentucky families. And it's going to be like they got a free Toys R Us to walk into and really treat their kids um, to something really special after something really horrible. Speaking of generosity, as of today, the Team Kentucky Fund now over $21 million with 112,621 donations. 100% of that is going to go to helping these families and these communities. There will be zero administrative fees. We've announced the first two pieces of how we want to help people. Number one uh, is funeral expenses. And number two is helping uninsured homeowners. And there were a bunch. This hit uh, a lot of neighborhoods where people couldn't afford homeowners insurance um, with 10% on top of what they are awarded from FEMA for costs not covered by FEMA. And for those individuals, remember, you can't use these dollars for what FEMA covers. So yesterday was pretty special, just like uh, Tuesday and Thursday at these storefronts are going to be special. So yesterday I was joined by the Lieutenant Governor and UK men's basketball coach John Calipari and Manny um, uh, Ahome, President and CEO of Samaritan's Feet. Man, he's a good guy to pass out shoes to displaced Kentuckians. UK Athletics uh, Director Mitch Barnhart uh, was there, and he brought former men basketball player uh, players Darius Miller and Jack Goose Givens, which are two homegrown national champions. Um, shoes were delivered to Lake Barkley and Penny Ryle Forest State Resort Parks. I can't thank them enough. And the, these guys were were great. I mean, they walked around and talked directly uh, to people. They asked them how they were doing, and they listened. Um, it was a chance where people got to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with Cal or, or Darius or Goose um, or, or Mitch, and, and they weren't just showing empathy. Um, they really cared, and, and they spent a ton of time uh, with people. I also want to do a special thank you to Owensboro Independent Schools for working with our park staff. They transported people from the other state parks that we couldn't be at to these two. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's been through a lot. Through these two um, to make sure that everybody got an opportunity. It allowed families at all four state parks to, to truly participate. As of this morning, the state parks alone are housing 635 displaced Kentuckians and 194 first responders. Currently, there are 226 rooms occupied by displaced Kentuckians. 92 rooms have been provided to first responders, but we still have some vacancies. So come, let us take care of you. We're guaranteeing at least a month's stay. Everybody I talk to at any of these parks feel safe. 
there. And it's a place where we can provide the services that you may need. So Kentucky Dam Village, four rooms open. Ken Lake, 13 rooms open. Lake Barkley, three rooms open. Barron River Lake, 42 rooms open. John James Audubon, four rooms open. And Rough River Dam State Resort Park, 51 rooms open. Kentucky State Parks will be looking for volunteers after the new year. That's what we need, volunteers after the new year to help with dining room, kitchen, housekeeping, and laundry. I got to meet some of the volunteers from all over Kentucky. There's one man who had gone through those historic uh, tornadoes years ago in Arkansas. He moved to Kentucky, and after this happened, he wanted to be there to help. That's that's pretty neat. Those interested in volunteering should call uh, should contact Andy Kazitz via his email, Andy dot Kazitz at ky.gov. That's A-N-D-Y. I can spell that piece. Dot K-A-S-I-T-Z at ky.gov. I got to uh, talk to him and apologize for putting his email out there to the entire world. Um, he said his phone blew up, but he loved every single minute of it. Um, in your email to Andy, to that Andy, include your name, your cell phone number, the name of the park or parks at which you wish to volunteer, and your availability. Uh, Andy's pulling really long days and long nights to make this work, but when you see that type of outpouring of support, it keeps you going. All right, we're going to go over disaster unemployment assistance again because we have this up and running. So individuals who have become unemployed or those who are self-employed and had work interrupted in 14 Kentucky counties as a result of the severe storms, straight line winds, flooding, and tornadoes on December 10th are eligible to apply for these benefits through the Kentucky Office of Unemployment Insurance. Those counties include Caldwell, Christian, Fulton, Graves, Hart, Hickman, Hopkins, Logan, Lyon, Marshall, Muhlenberg, Ohio, Taylor, and Warren. In order to qualify for DUA benefits, claimants in eligible counties must show their employment or self-employment was lost or interrupted as a result of these tornadoes and that they're not otherwise eligible for traditional unemployment, right? So if you are eligible for traditional unemployment, we'll get you on that. But what this is, is if you typically couldn't get that, you still have to apply, you are denied because you don't qualify under state and federal law, and then you can get in this program. That's more than anybody should have to go through. That's the federal system. So this is like farmers and self-employed individuals who traditionally couldn't get unemployment insurance can get this. Affected individuals should go to the Kentucky Career website, kcc.ky.gov, or call 502-875-0442 for your initial claim. you got to file your initial claim by January 18th. And after claimants apply, remember you have to apply for traditional. You can attend an in-person session for assistance at one of the following locations through Wednesday, December 22nd. We have them up here. There's one in Bowling Green and Madisonville and E-Town and Owensboro and in Mayfield. It's not necessary to attend one of these, but we've worked really hard to get in-person help back for people. And as we've all been painfully aware of these last two years, it is an incredibly difficult system where if you answer one question wrong, you can be disqualified for benefits, even though you don't know it will disqualify you for benefits. So you don't have to go to an in-person session, but you really should. And we'll get more of them after the holidays. Kentucky State Police has received several complaints in reference to fraudulent disaster relief workers. We need to get the word out that these individuals are posing as FEMA representatives, American Red Cross workers, insurance adjustments, contractors for debris removal, or general contractors, when all they are are miserable human beings that are trying to take from people who don't have anything to take. While there are reports of fraudulent workers, there are also legitimate FEMA teams, housing inspectors, and other officials working in areas impacted by the storms. Legitimate representatives carry official identification badges and photo ID, and they will also have your FEMA application number. So if you've registered with FEMA and somebody shows up and claims to be FEMA, they should have your number. FEMA and the U.S. Small Business Association representatives never charge you for assistance. 
goes back to my AG days. If anybody is trying to charge you on the spot for disaster assistance, if anybody's trying to get you to pay ahead, that is a scam. Do not do it and report them to your local police. I know they would like to find them. FEMA representatives will never promise a disaster grant in return for payment and are never authorized to collect your personal financial information. Anybody who observes individuals removing items from property, that's called looting, can also call the Kentucky State Police, the National Guard, or local law enforcement. State Police are 270-856-3721. If you see this occurring, remember, until that person is caught, they're going to try to prey on other people. So together, we're really helping out each other. Together, let's stop other people from hurting those that have already been hurt way too much. All right. Um, quick facts from the transportation cabinet. Uh, they've opened a temporary driver license issuing station in Mayfield at 355 Charles Drive. We've waived fees for getting those. The office is operating Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time, at least through January 28th. We're working to set one up in Dawson Springs, too. The people uh, ultimately will need to get their license. All right, we're going to move to the COVID update. And let's start with good news, because we need good news in our fight against COVID. Today, we received some reassuring news from Moderna. The company said that a booster dose of its COVID-19 vaccine should offer protection against the quickly spreading Omicron variant. Moderna said lab tests revealed the half-dose booster shot increased by 37 times the level of antibodies to fight Omicron. The company said a full-dose booster was even stronger, uh, and they noted that the full-dose booster also had an increase in the usual side effects. While half doses are being used for most Moderna bo boosters, a full dose third shot has been recommended for those with weakened immune systems. So if you're like me and you had Moderna, first of all, you're really happy about it at this moment. Um, but if you, if you don't have a weakened immune system, you've gotten the regular booster, which is a half dose. That's good. You're in a good place against Omicron, but please regularly get tested. And if you get it, reach out to your, your doctors, let them help you through it. If you haven't gotten your booster yet, and you have a weakened immune system, you're going to be eligible for a full dose Moderna booster, which is twice as much as everybody normally gets. Pfizer's testing has also found that its COVID-19 vaccine caused a similarly increase in, in antibodies for fighting Omicron. So the message here is pretty simple. Omicron is spreading faster than anything we've ever seen. It looks like it's one of the most contagious viruses in modern history. Some of the therapeutics, the ways that we help you out, won't work on it. That's pretty scary. Like the monoclonal antibodies won't work on it. But you know what does? Being vaccinated and being boosted. It means that if you're freshly vaccinated, you're pretty well protected, or at least as well protected as we can get you. If you're fully uh, vaccinated and boosted, Again, it looks like you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and that's what we appear to be seeing in New York. Uh, I saw this this morning um, on the news, if we could put up the, the graph. So New York is just getting ravaged by Omicron. It is spreading through that city like crazy. It's shutting all different types of things down. But hospitalization numbers are very different than the case numbers and they have a pretty high uh, vaccination rate. So I wanna to talk to you about what these lines are uh, because um, they show that Omicron is really hitting unvaccinated individuals and not ho hospitalizing many vaccinated individuals. So the, the yellow line there is kind of the entire population and what we're seeing in the increase in, in hospitalization since Omicron, you see it going up a little bit, still a little early, but just going up a little bit. The green line is vaccinated individuals, right? And that's pretty flat. That means these vaccines, looking at New York and their experience, are working pretty well. But guess what red is? That's unvaccinated individuals. 
And after Delta had come through, it has started going down, but Omicron has it increasing and increasing significantly. So it may be that you still contract COVID, the Omicron variant, if you're vaccinated, but it doesn't look like you will get very sick or it is unlikely you will get sick. If you are unvaccinated, looks like it can hit you and hit you pretty hard. And we certainly hope that that is not the case. But with this data that we're seeing, and this is all in real time, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please consider doing it now. Please consider doing it now. Because if you get sick, like this chart is showing, we don't have the same tools to, to help you out. All right, let's go through our numbers. On Saturday, we had 2,575 new cases, 32 new deaths. On Sunday, 1,531 new cases, 29 new deaths. Today, we had 1,215 new cases, 32 new deaths, and uh, a tough one. Included a 29-year-old woman from here in Franklin County. Included a 34-year-old man from Martin County. Currently hospitalized 1,206 Kentuckians, 325 in the ICU, 176 on a ventilator. Uh, current positivity, 9.20%. Last three days, that's inching up. Uh, let's look at our stair-stepper charts where we can kind of uh, chart where this has gone. One thing we don't know is the size of the impact of the tornadoes and data that we are, are getting. Uh, certainly, we're not going to have the same amount of testing in some parts of Kentucky. Um, and we just don't know exactly um, how much that has or has not impacted the numbers in the coming weeks. I think we will see that. Uh, but what we have seen, at least in the last three weeks, appears to be somewhat of a leveling out. And we see that both in uh, case numbers, because remember we had two weeks that, that the cases numbers were almost identical. Last week was a little less, but remember we just got Omicron Friday. Friday, I think was our first case. Case numbers will go up. We'll be watching hospitalizations real closely. That will end up being our major metric that we follow during Omicron. But given that it is more contagious, um, unless a whole lot of people go out there and get boosted and vaccinated for the first time. These case numbers are going to shoot up. But but again, when we look at these peaks going back in our fight against COVID, deaths and hospitalizations were just a couple of weeks behind and also peaked and surged at the same time. We don't know that's going to be the case. And we certainly don't think it's going to be to the same magnitude with, with Omicron. Uh, so, you know, there's some tough parts about that variant. There are some that that might be um, at least not bad news. I wouldn't call any of it good news. Uh, test positivity, um, really about the, the same, uh, seeing somewhat of a leveling. I will say last couple of days it is ticking up, which is concerning. But again, with Omicron, I think we had one area that was talking about a 30, it was in South Africa talking about a 30% positivity rate. So again, positivity rate isn't going to be uh, the same when we're talking about this one. It's going to be how sick are people as opposed to who has tested positive. Um, also saw a little bit of a leveling the last couple of days on hospitalizations. If we can show the, the line graph, um, we hope that holds. And again, we hope that this isn't impacted by, by the, the tornadoes. And when you think about it, there's a number of hospitals in these areas. Um, same in intensive care um, and, and generally the same in ventilator uh, usage. And remember, this is just ventilators for COVID-19. Vaccines, two pieces of good news. And one um, uh, thing we learned from the federal government. Pieces of good news is over the weekend, 10,351 Kentuckians getting their very first shot of hope. That's another 10,000 Kentuckians that have decided to get vaccinated. Almost as good, 32,719 people getting their booster over the weekend. 
but we did have an adjustment in our fully vaccinated number. It doesn't change our percentages. So what the federal government was doing with J and J was counting the second shot, which is technically a booster at people being fully vaccinated when they were in fact fully vaccinated when they got their first J and J. So we, we have a reduction of 11,592 people from the fully vaccinated now. Those 11,592 have been added into the numbers of boosted. Now, they were people who had gotten their booster that, that uh, were misinterpreted as becoming fully vaccinated. Let's go to our age breakdown because we have a couple of pieces of good news. We're still at 62% of every man, woman, and child in Kentucky in roughly one year that have gotten vaccinated, never been done in human history. That brings us to 2,749,942. And even doing something that's never been done in human history, it's not enough. So keep going. Uh, of eligible, uh, we're up one, 66%, two thirds of every man, woman, and child that is eligible to get a vaccine has gotten it. Um, and then those that make their own health care decisions, 73%. You know, you read a lot about divisiveness around vaccines. That is not divisive. That's three quarters of everybody who can make their own decision, making the same decision on the facts or the science or doing it for their families, whatever the reason. Yes, we need to do more. But when was the last thing that three quarters of everybody agreed on anything? This is positive but it's got to be better. And then as we go down through our numbers, the one that's changed, 25 to 39 is now over 60%. That puts them in the yellow. Um, and then 5 to 11 up 1 at 15%. We do, parents, we do need more parents of 5 to 11-year-olds um, to get vaccinated. Omicron's going to be really hard on schools. It's going to be really hard on schools. Those that have universal masking are going to be in the best shape, but those that have the highest percentage of kids that are vaccinated are also going to be in the best shape to stay in person. We've all said that that we want our kids to stay in person. I do. Data two middle schoolers, especially when you have middle schoolers, you want them in school. Um, but then you look at everything else that we want to continue to be able to, to do in person and to do it safely. Pretty easy. Get vaccinated mask when appropriate. All right. So Christmas coming up too. Uh, really two out of three things. This was good advice from some national experts that you need to do to have a safe Christmas. Number one, and this is the one that has got to be there. Everybody needs to be vaccinated and boosted that is eligible. That's coming over. That's first. And then you need really one of the next two. You need everybody to test as close as they can. If you have a rapid take-home test, I would do it the morning before you're going to leave to, to go into the other home. If everybody does that, if everybody's vaccinated and is tested, you're, you're relatively safe. Now, it could be that you've got it. It just hasn't manifested uh, yet, uh, but you're in pretty good shape. Otherwise, vaccine and masking in certain indoor settings is the other way to be safe. Uh, I know I'm going to get tested uh, before uh, I go to our Christmas celebration, uh, my family and everybody that's going to be there fully vaccinated. So make sure that you follow those steps. All right, let's end with the news. We normally start these press conferences on until recent events, new jobs. As the Kentucky is watching, no, we have shattered every single economic development record to the best new job and industry creation in our history this year, uh, even with everything that we have faced. And now it continues. Taylor Corporation is adding 28 jobs with a Radcliffe expansion. They are investing $18.8 million in, label, in a label production plant. These are 28 quality job opportunities uh, where the leaders plan to expand the company's existing uh, facility on South Dixie Boulevard by 30,000 square feet to support its growth. They produce pressure sensitive labels for a variety of industries like consumer packaged goods, manufacturing and distribution, healthcare, and retail. 
Jobs created by the expansion will include press operators, material handlers, and supervisors, adding to their current employment of 85 Kentucky residents. Company leaders plan to break ground on the expansion in the first quarter of next year, and we look forward to it. Another one, Commonwealth Rolled Products is adding 40 well-paying jobs in its Lewisport facility. It is going to invest $167 million in its existing aluminum rolling mill, uh, creating those 40 full-time jobs in the years ahead. Company's commitment in its 2.3 square million square foot facility on Kentucky Highway 1957 includes investment in new equipment, building upgrades to modernize operations and better position them to support automotive and industrial customers. New jobs associated with the project will include production, technical, and leadership roles. Currently, the company maintains over a thousand full-time employees in Hancock County, including 875 Kentucky residents. It is really exciting. That is a great employer in the region, and we are excited that they are expanding. But then there is one more. Universal Piping Industries is going to relocate and expand in Georgetown, creating 25 high-wage jobs, and just wait until you hear what they pay. Uh, UPI will relocate its facility on nearly 13 acres in Lanes Run Business Park in Georgetown. Construction is expected in February of 2022. It'll be completed by April of 2023. The expanded state-of-the-art operations will allow them to prefabricate customized piping and equipment to be installed at manufacturing facilities throughout the United States. Uh, they serve things like automotive, chemicals, manufacturing, financial institutions, and healthcare. So these are 53 new jobs with an expected hourly wage of $51, including benefits. All the journalists just ran out of here to apply for those jobs. Pretty neat. They're going to be pipe fitters and metal trade workers. All right. One other piece of good news. Last week, the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, announced that Kentucky is a finalist for the U.S. Economic Development Administration's $1 billion Build Back Better Regional Challenge. The challenge aims to boost economic pandemic recovery. Kentucky is one of 60 finalists and was chosen from a pool of 529 applicants. We'll receive $500,000 uh, to further our proposal. Winners can receive up to $100 million. Kentucky's project is called Prosperity Through Agritech Hub, or Kentucky's Path. It involves five aligned projects that revolve around the construction of a new state-of-the-art agritech research and development center that will establish Eastern Kentucky as an agriculture technology hub. What it will make sure is that we don't just have the facilities and the workers. We don't just grow the tomatoes and the strawberries, but the intellectual capital, the intellectual property, and the research is occurring right here in Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky, along with the rest of the work. Now, we've got a lot of partners in this, like the Dutch Economic Development Agencies, Workforce Innovation Boards, colleges, and others. And finally, our team, Kentucky All-Stars, is our incredible employees at our state parks. They helped us not only in this um, shoe event. Uh, oh, and by the way, that's the superintendent for... Dawson Springs back there. Uh, they also have opened their doors and accepted people that need their help the most. At Penny Ryle, I met three of their employees that typically work at the park that had lost their homes. They're now staying at the park they work at and they're still working. They get up in the in the in the rooms that they're staying in and they open the the kitchen or other things. It was it was really neat and to a person. Uh, they just said that that they wanted to help people and and they felt so good staying at the place they worked. One before this was part time. Isn't that amazing. And they're working every day, all day. I told her we got to find her a full time job. We're going to make sure we get that done. All right. Uh, let's open it up to questions. It looks like we have eight total journalists for here uh, four on the phone. We'll start with Karen. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, one on COVID and one on the storm. Uh, First of all, with the storm, a lot of counties have been getting too many supplies as far as clothing and certain things. Uh, so what are the best things now if people want to still collect that they need or the best mm -hmm. to give cash? 
And then the COVID question is, have you seen an uptick in testing at sites across the state? And if not, does that concern you? Uh, let me get an answer on overall uh, testing numbers. Uh, certainly think every holiday season we see more as we come into it. Uh, and every time that there's something like a new variant, we have vaccinations go up and we also have testing go up. But you know that uh, then again, we also have this disaster that's occurred, uh, though we are providing testing and we're going to look at providing vaccinations at the state parks um, where these folks um, are. Uh, and then the the tornado question. Was, uh, what are some surprises? Yeah. So, like, say, or yeah. Or? So, so the the donations have been incredible. They've been they've been more than any of us could have ever dreamed of. I mean, this world uh, has shown that it loves us. It's the only way to describe it. People across Kentucky and across the United States have shown that they love and that they care about us. There's a whole lot of good still in this world, and with all the noise that's been out there last couple of years about anything and everything. You want to talk about something that restores your faith in humanity. Um, I hope next time it doesn't take something like this, but it is truly special. And we have donations of every material good that anybody could ever need in the area. The monetary donations are um, the best way to help now. Uh, certainly we have our uh, Team Western Kentucky Relief Fund, but there are other good funds out there. There are also ways to help people, whether it's through um, uh, Visa cards or others, but at this point, that is the the, the best way. Um, certainly, you know, we're using our fund to come on top of FEMA for people who aren't insured, and and that FEMA amount isn't going to cover um, everything that they need. You know, that's certainly an area where I'd encourage other funds to come on top of us. Right now, if you're an uninsured homeowner, thirty seven thousand nine hundred, and you're out. But if we can add another three thousand. 3,790. On top of that, we're a little over 41,000. We have a couple more groups come in and do the same. We could potentially get these folks up closer to 50,000, and that'd be a good thing. Chad. I noticed a little bit ago you had a moment where you paused and you saw that picture of you with that little boy. I know you probably heard so many stories of survival and, and yeah. loss, and, and I know it's been tough for you. Talk to me about some of those that you've taken away and what you hope Kentuckians, especially this week of Christmas. Yeah. Think of all these. Yeah, it, it, um, Sunday was moving. Um, I mean, the, everybody penny around me, my grandparents. Um, and, and I did get news that my granddad's church may be salvageable and that'd be, that'd be good. Um, these are people that have lost everything, virtually every person I was talking to and, and also up to Princeton. Had had lost um, had lost their homes. Um, there was a, a kid there whose arm was broken during it. I got to sign his cast, um, and his mom had been impaled. She was she was doing she was doing all right though. Got to hug her, and we're gonna personally check on that FEMA claim and make sure that it is uh, moving. Had a man who lost his mom and his aunt, who are in the house together. Um, I actually recognized her from the picture. Um, had met her before when I'd been in, in Dawson. He said, uh, he said they watched our updates uh, and that's what they would call them about and, and they'd do it uh, together. Um, they had a young family. Um, she'd lost her, her mom. She might lose uh, her dad. It was really hard. Met a, met a woman in, in, from Mayfield that had been in the candle factory and she's still shaking. Now it's pretty cold, but she was still uh, shaking. Um, but you know what? They were all leaning on each other. And when we said that we we're going to be there every step of the way, they know. They know uh, we're going to. Um, many grateful to be uh, alive. And and actually most of them uh, moving through the FEMA process or 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 the rest, which is a good thing. Um, I, I, I did definitely learn that we got more renters than I thought, and we're going to have to find more ways to, to help them. But, you know, the number of kids who went through trauma in this, I mean, in a bathtub with a mom or a dad and a, a mattress over them, you know, just hoping as their house exploded that they wouldn't go uh, 
with it. So we want to make sure we're there for those kids as long as we can be. I, I did love that there's this one kid who had been through it, who's real young, and we pulled out this blue pair of shoes. And, oh, he lit up. And Manny and I put the shoes on him. Uh, I was laughing that if this doesn't work out, I'm going to work at Foot Locker. Um, <laughs> and, and he looked at, he, he, he looked at him and, and, and said, can I run in him? And he just starts taking off around the crowd. I mean, just pure moment of joy by this kid. Um, I wasn't supposed to, but handing another kid uh, shoes, he starts crying. So I, I gave him a second pair, you know. I mean, I didn't want him to have to decide between the two different ones. Take them both. They were going to be the only two pair of shoes other than the ones he had on his feet. So special moments. And I'm, I'm going to see all of them again um, for that group on Thursday. They're going to be sick of me by the time this is done. Tom? Thanks, Governor. Uh, two quickies. COVID-related, have we gotten any wind yet of any outbreak uh, out in that western Kentucky area of uh, people who have been stuck in congregate settings? And do we have more Omicron counties today? Uh, I don't have a list of more Omicron counties, but there are. I mean, Omicron is probably in every county by now. We've had at least two positives um, uh, for for COVID um, in in the area with people who had been in congregate settings. Uh, we're doing a number of things. The number one thing to reduce the spread is getting people in their own rooms, right? I mean, that's the number one thing we can do, and we're almost all the way uh, there. Um, I, I've worked with uh, Judge Perry directly on getting folks from a church out to, I think, Kinlake. We had the whole thing waiting for them. I think it was Kinlake. Um, you know, the second thing is we are doing testing, and, and we're going to have some some offers of vaccines and, and boosters as well. Merry yeah. Christmas to you and the family. Merry Christmas to you, Tom. Uh, Mike? I was actually going to ask about the confidence setting uh, based on only one question. Um, about at-home tests, everyone reports the people struggling with finding that mm -hmm. test. Yeah. So at home tests right now are sold in in convenience stores and pharmacies, but there's going to be a huge run on them before the holidays. And you shouldn't assume that you're going to be able to get one uh, before this holiday. So look up, go through our website, go through the federal government's website and look up where you can get a test that will get your results back before the holidays. And if the best you can find is, is 48 hours results, get your test 48 hours before, you know, just do the very best that you can. But I would not assume that you can go out on the 23rd and buy a take home test that you can take on the 24th or on the 25th. So I would really encourage people go ahead and look at scheduling a test. We're scheduling them here in the Capitol, for instance, for our employees. I think um, the last day that we have the majority of people is, is, is the 22nd or the 23rd. Uh, Debbie Yetter, Courier Journal. Hey, Governor. Um, do you have any estimates at this point, preliminary estimates of the number of people affected by the tornadoes, either through loss of life, property, or other factors? And do you have any guesstimates at, at possible damages total? Uh, damages in the billions. Definitely in the in the billions. Um, so if we look at people impacted, right, we, we now can work with a firmer number of 76 Kentuckians that we have lost with the possibility that that, that grows, but that possibility is a little bit less uh, every day that goes on. And that's a good thing. Uh, you think about 10,000 plus insurance claims filed. So those are homes um, or, or possibly, I think those are all homes, but they could be uh, renters too. So those are uh, families. Uh, we think we got between uh, 1,000 and 2,000 uninsured uh, homeowners, so you can add that on top. But, I mean, we're looking at, I mean, the city of Mayfield's 10 plus thousand. Dawson is right around 3,000. Um, uh, Bremen is, is you know, 300 plus. Uh, Taylor County wasn't fully hit, but, I mean, we're, 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 we're looking at over 15,000, I'd say, Kentuckians, if, if not 25,000 that have been impacted in some way. But I tell you what, um, a lot of you all have been 
in the middle of Mayfield and everybody who, who has everybody who walks uh, what used to be Dawson Springs is, is impacted. I mean, this, this is, this has hit us as a state. We should focus on helping the people of the region, but I'm going to try to find a way to do something on, on mental health coming out of this and trauma for the whole state. Um, I'm just still working on how, how we do that. Uh, Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News. Um, hi, Governor. Um, what are you talking to hospitals about right now regarding the Omicron variant? And are any of them, um, to your knowledge, limiting elective procedures at this time? At this time, I know of no hospital that is limiting elective procedures other than Mayfield, which isn't doing everything because it doesn't have water. Now it's getting water from tanker trucks, but but that may be impacting uh, some of its uh, operations. Um, always in contact with our hospitals, looking at what they are uh, seeing. Uh, certainly we have asked in the last month or so, especially as Delta um, was, looked like it was increasing again, uh, to reconfirm their direct relationship with nursing programs uh, as, a, as something that they could directly turn on with really good experiences there. I actually heard today um, about uh, the British and their plan on on kind of a virtual hospital where they could bring in other practitioners, check on people regularly at home. Uh, that's something that I'd like to explore because if Omicron is not as severe, uh, what we don't want is to be telling people to stay home that should come to the hospital. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want people taking up hospital beds that don't have to be there. So how do we check on everybody regularly to to make sure that they are um, in a good place. But the other way is getting people vaccinated, right? Because if you saw that chart for New York, uh, every unvaccinated individual that has to be hospitalized looks like wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been hospitalized if they'd been vaccinated. That's a bed for a heart attack patient or somebody who's had a, a stroke, you know, someone dealing with cancer, somebody who needs to have a, a procedure for their health, the number one thing that we can do to protect hospital capacity, heck, the number one thing that we can do to address our nursing burnout is to get vaccinated. It helps those individuals. Uh, April Rickard from WFPL. Thank you, Governor. Um, when will vaccination and testing start at the state parks? And is there other outreach planned? And second, do you have an estimate on the number of jobs lost due to the storms? Yeah, um, let me get you let me get you a firm answer on the first. I know some testing has already been done. Uh, the local health department is is taking the lead with that. Any vac the vaccination, let's call it a clinic or outreach efforts that hasn't started uh, yet. We are working. Uh, on that. Obviously, you can still get vaccinated at a number of places around. And good Lord, if anybody has expressed the desire in any of those parks to get vaccinated, uh, I hope I hope we've gotten it to them. If not, I'm going to have a conversation with some people. The jobs are are really hard. Um, so there's an impact to the Corvette plant in, in Bowling Green. Uh, and that that's going to be a period of time. We're working with that as a group. Uh, met a gentleman who's warehouse was leveled um, in the, I think it's called the Trans Park in Bowling Green as well. It went through businesses. I think it hit uh, Crown as well. So there will be, those won't be lost, but those people may be unemployed and us helping them for a period of time until it's back up and, and going. But I mean, in Mayfield, the small businesses, um, the, the, the buildings, if they stand, are going to have to be knocked down and the rubble removed and, and rebuilt um, to start again. So uh, we don't have an exact number yet, but it, it, it may be many. Um, now, a lot of people in the area are farmers and our goal is, is gonna be first to get them on the, the, the disaster relief, but second, how do we, how do we address if, if they didn't lose um, their livestock or you know, how, or, or, or they lost their customers, right? How do we connect them um, with with people for that? There are so many people out there that want to help that if we can wrap our arms around some of those pieces, I believe that there's a, a whole big world that, that wants to help. All right. 
Scotty, am I calling on one more? Or is that it? Huh? That's it. All right. Um, a long one today. Um, but, you know, some pieces of good news, even coming out of a difficult situation. Um, we will not have an update this Thursday. I want to wish everybody a really Merry Christmas. Please be safe. Continue to think about those families in Western Kentucky. Uh, they said it to me. They thank everybody for the love. They can't understand why this tornado would hit them, but they are floored and grateful uh, for the outpouring of support from everybody, for people continuing to tell their stories and, and mainly uh, just for caring about them. That's who we are. We're good neighbors. We're good people. We love one another. Let's make sure we keep it up.